to you, my friends. At one of my previous assignments, there was a parishioner who frequently tried my patience. Now, for the sake of anonymity, I won't use a real name. I'll call her Marie. And to further protect this person's identity, let me just add that in my life, there have been plenty of people who have tried my patience, so no trying to figure out who this could be. Marie was an elderly woman who lived in a neighborhood in the house that she was born in. And even though she had a home, she preferred to live most of her days walking the streets of the neighborhood. It didn't matter if it was 100 degrees or 10 below, if it was sunny or raining cats and dogs. Mary would be out there. If you saw her, you might assume that she was homeless. But she wasn't. Anyway, she was kind of a fixture at the parish, and in our planning of new events, we, we never worried that no one would show up because we always knew that at the very least, Marie would be there. So that's a good thing. Not so good, though. On Ash Wednesday, when we typically would have six or seven masses to distribute ashes, you guessed it, Marie would be at all six or seven masses receiving ashes at each one. Every year I tried to explain to her that receiving ashes at one mass per year was enough. But sure enough, she would still show up. At the start of every year, we would do as many parishes do, which is to hand out free calendars. And I think there's some unwritten rule that says that you're only allowed to take one or two so that there might be enough for everyone. Well, you guessed it, not the case with Marie. She would grab a huge stack of calendars and I could never imagine why she needed so many. Well, one year I discovered why. I found out through another parishioner that she was selling them in front of the neighborhood Walgreens. This was Marie. Nothing could ever stop her. Not her tired body, not the weather, and definitely not some punk young priest. Eventually, I learned to not pay attention. And even though she was always around the parish, she kind of became invisible to me. Well, in 1996, she appeared once again on my radar in such a profound way that it totally changed my viewpoint of her. I was at a packed Holy Name Cathedral filled with the priests of the Archdiocese of Chicago. This was one of various prayer services that were scheduled for the different constituencies of the Archdiocese in the wake of Cardinal Bertini's death. For those who can remember, he was a very much loved archbishop who had truly become a pastor in the best sense of the word, and not just to Chicago Catholics, but to people of goodwill everywhere. And everyone was invited to the cathedral to pay their last respects. If you remember, the line stretched for blocks around the cathedral as people waited for those precious few seconds just to be able to say goodbye. And to accommodate the crowds, the cathedral was even left open day and night around the clock interrupted only by those various planned prayer services. At some point, an usher would break the line, and those last few mourners would make their way to the front, and then they would be escorted out, and the service would begin. That evening, as I was waiting in my pew for the last mourners to file out so that the service could begin, I couldn't believe my eyes. But there she was. Marie was one of the last persons in that line. I was amazed because I thought to myself, she probably walked to the cathedral from her home. And to be honest, she probably cut the line too. I laughed and I thought to myself, good for her. I learned something about Marie, Marie that day. I learned that nothing, absolutely nothing could ever stop Marie. Today we celebrate Passion Sunday. And the focus of today is on the proclamation of Jesus' suffering and death on the cross. This year, we get to hear Matthew's version. Now, Matthew, Mark, and Luke pretty much tell the same story, except for a few minor details here and there. Well, Matthew's version has a very interesting detail that is only found in his version. It's always fascinated me. All the Gospels tell us that Jesus was buried in the tomb. But Matthew's Gospel adds a further drama. The religious leaders were worried that even though they had put a stop to Jesus by having him crucified, they were worried that some of his followers would come in the middle of the night to steal his body, and then what they thought 
falsely claim that Jesus had risen from the dead. Even though they had rolled a huge stone in front of the entrance, making it very difficult for anyone to move it without being noticed, the leaders wanted another layer of security to put a stop to Jesus. And they asked Pilate to have the tomb secured. So Pilate sent a guard, and Matthew, and Matthew's story ends with him telling us that they secured the tomb by fixing a seal to the stone and setting the guard. They fixed the seal. Biblical scholars and archaeologists tell us that this would have been some ropes that would have been stretched across the surface of that huge stone, and the ends would have touched the actual tomb. And they would have been attached to the tomb with either some clay or some wax, and on that clay or wax would have been stamped the emperor's seal. The only way to get access to the tomb was by breaking that seal. Of course, this meant that to do that, one would be defying Roman law and could expect a severe penalty, including death. In their efforts to stop Jesus, it wasn't just good enough that Jesus had died. His death had come out through the human power of their will. And even though they were successful, that wasn't good enough. So the stone was placed in front of the entrance. Now, this was customary as a way to keep out wild animals. But in this case, they realized the power of their own will was not good enough. So they needed the power of nature, which is the immovability of that huge stone, to stop not only wild animals from coming in, but the disciples as well, wishing to steal his body. And more importantly, it would stop someone on the inside from coming out. So the power of nature was not good enough to stop Jesus. And they needed the power of the Roman government to literally and figuratively seal the deal. All of this was meant to stop Jesus. Although today's gospel leaves us in suspense until Easter Sunday, we know that no human power, no power of nature, no power of Roman government was able to stop him. I find that thought to be comforting as we enter into one of the most surreal and challenging Holy Weeks ever. This weekend is one of the days where record numbers of people come to receive less palms, but they will not be able to do so this year. It has become a well-established tradition at St. Andrew that on Holy Thursday, not only the priest washes feet, but parishioners also wash each other's feet. But there will be no foot washing this year. On Friday, we should be venerating the cross, an instrument of death, but for believers, this is the wood of the cross on which hung the Savior of the world. But no cross will be venerated this year. And on Easter, we traditionally celebrate the service of light, and we renew our baptismal promises and are sprinkled with holy water. But there will be no candles or holy water this year. None of these things will happen this year in our church as we've grown accustomed to. But my friends, that doesn't mean that we can't celebrate these things within our own homes. Let me assure you that we will indeed be blessing palms and passing them out along with the newly blessed water at a later date when it is safe to do so. These things, though, which we call sacramentals, are reminders of something much deeper, something about our faith. On each of these three days that we call the Triduum, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and Holy Saturday, we can observe those actions that normally would be celebrated in this church. We can still wash each other's feet in the confines of our homes. We can still venerate the cross that hangs on the wall. We can still celebrate the light of Christ by lighting a candle. And we can affirm our faith by renewing our baptismal promises to our family. For each of us, these days that we will be observing are holy days that offer us opportunities. And we will be suggesting some of those opportunities to you through the Your Sunday Connection, which you can find either by going on the website 
or signing up for Flocknote. Details for signing up for Flocknote can also be found on the website. My dear friends, as we enter into this holiest of weeks, let us not be discouraged by all the limitations that we now face. Let us keep in mind Matthew's story of the Passion and take comfort in the story that it tells us, which is most appropriate for us at this time. It tells us that despite all of their efforts, the religious leaders of Jesus' time failed. And as proof, we have a broken seal, a stone rolled open, and an empty tomb. Yes, this is indeed a difficult time for us, but we will get through it together with God's help. And if Marie taught me anything, it is this. Nothing, absolutely nothing, can stop us.